So, greatest concern for me in my work, most important, greatest importance for me as a scholar. The two work together, certainly. The greatest importance for me as a scholar is uh, my personal integrity. I would like to say that that was true for all scholars, but I see that as a scholarly lapse on a regular basis. It is an unfortunate reality that careerism in the, in the academy motivates some scholars to operate in a manner which is not a highest personal integrity. But, and, and we're certainly we all have lapses from integrity um, from time to time, but after my first wife died, I just decided I was going to do the best I could possibly do in order to maintain my self-respect and my ability to maintain integrity, uh, since that was seen that at that time that's all I had. I didn't have a job, I didn't have anything. I had a ten-year-old daughter to take care of. And so I was really down to the basics and that seemed to be the most basic thing I could do. In my work, my work deals with the history of tantric or esoteric Buddhism by and large. Um, my books, my articles, everything, almost everything that I've written has is, is been focused on that, uh, either as a prelude to it or as uh, a subsequent uh, circumstance. Most recently, I am involved with uh, a number of documents from the 6th, 7th, and 8th century in India. I've pretty much nailed down the origins of Tantric Buddhism. Um, and I'm looking at the earliest level of these documents. That's why I was awarded uh, fellowships recently from the National Endowment of Humanities and the American Council of Learned Societies, and various other awards that I've gotten, all having to do with this notion of dealing with uh, this, what some perceive, and I think correctly, is a hole in Buddhist studies scholarship. And this is uh, what's happening there in the 6th and 7th century so that you find this sudden development of this uh, form of Buddhism that seems to be, uh, seems to have gone in a, in, a, in a tangential direction from the larger history of Indian Buddhism. As is usual in those kinds of instances, uh, you find that there are foreshadowings, but none of those foreshadowings individually or collectively manage to aggregate to the system as it matures in the middle of the seventh century. And so uh, I see this within this one particular document of, uh, that was presented to the Chinese throne in 654 uh, called the Dharani Sangraha, put together by three monks from Bodhgaya, which sounds like a restaurant, but it's actually uh, three guys, uh, Atikuta and uh, uh, Kashipa and Sangananda Vimoksha, these three monks. Uh, they sort of put themselves together and aggregated this from a number of documents that they had in there in China. But the method of their aggregation and the method in which, and the new material that they put in, indicates that we see, uh, for the first time, this is our first documentary evidence of a new form of Buddhism, this tantric Buddhism that's happening, which is a highly ritualized Buddhism. And as I have argued in the past, it's a Buddhism which is configured around a specific political metaphor, that the monk receives rituals and acts in the manner of becoming a universal conqueror, uh, Chakravartin in Sanskrit. And so that idea of coronation rituals and fire rituals and various other rituals, all of which are ancillary to uh, this notion of political dominion, become taken into a Buddhist monastery and employed by monks uh, for the purposes of a, an appropriation of a imperial narrative. And that's really what it is. It's about a re-narrativization of Buddhism and a complete collapse of the otherwise comprehensible distinction in Buddhism between the sacred and the profane, between the political and the religious spheres. And so that re-narrativization of Buddhism as a uh, appropriating political narratives for soteriological purposes is what uh, this form of Buddhism more than anything else does. It, it has many other tangents involved with it, but this continues to hold through the entire history of Tantric Buddhism, continue to hold as the, as the central form. And so most of the other phenomenon uh, associated with it extend out from that. Not invariably, but most of the cases. And, and that, that seems to be a, a unifying, 
a unifying form.